Lord, thank you for these words. Thank you for the opportunity to sing them together. That we would praise you from the heart with our lips in a state of grace is all of your kindness. Lord, that you have had mercy on us who were born running away from you in antagonism toward you, by nature objects of wrath. You have made us vessels of your mercy and objects of your love. What staggering truth. We pray that you'd help us tonight as we open your word, look again at the life of Nebuchadnezzar. And we pray that we would be humble before you. We ask it by your power in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Open your Bibles once again to Daniel chapter 4. And we're looking at pride before a fall. We'll close out Daniel chapter 4 this evening. I'll begin with a poem. This is William Ernest Henley. You may be familiar. This poem is entitled Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. What a claim that last stanza gives two quotes, virtual quotes from Scripture. One, a statement from Jesus, the way is narrow, the gate is straight that leads to life, and few there are that find it. He says, I don't care what God says. And the next to last line is a summary of coming judgment outlined in the Scriptures. I don't care how charged with the scroll is with punishments. I don't care what God says. I'm in charge of me. I'm going to read another poem, this one from the lips of the living God. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. What a frightening thing it is to hear on the lips of a creature totally dependent on the creating and sustaining God of the universe, to hear words like that poem, Invictus, or to hear the words that Nebuchadnezzar uttered here in Daniel chapter 4. We're going to be picking up in verse 28 and read to the end of the chapter. Follow along as I read this. This will be the text we study tonight. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. And you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. What we see here in this passage is God bringing Nebuchadnezzar low and God raising him up again. We're going to trace the narration of God bringing him low and raising him up in six stages. Verse 28 gives us a summary. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. All what? All that was told by God through the dream as interpreted by Daniel, that he would be removed from his sovereignty, that he would live like a beast in the field. We begin here with the king's boast. Listen to this. Verse 29, 12 months later, 12 months after he got the warning from Daniel, the interpretation of the dream and the exhortation, change your ways. 12 months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Here is Nebuchadnezzar. One year later, after gracious warning, gracious exhortation from God, on the roof of his palace, the roof of his royal residence, overlooking the city of Babylon, the greatest city in the world at the time, and congratulating himself. There is a lot of information about Babylon that has been disclosed to us by recent archaeology the last 120 years. One inscription gives Nebuchadnezzar's words about his kingdom as this, quote, all the lands, the entire inhabited world, kings of far off mountains and remote regions belong to my kingdom. One called inscription number nine says, the produce of the lands, the product of the mountains, the wealth of the sea I received in my kingdom. Under her everlasting shadow, I gathered all men in peace. Vast heaps of grain beyond measure I stored up within her and they feed the world. The Grotefend cylinder says this. Then I built the palace, the seat of my royalty, the bond of the race of men, the dwelling of joy and rejoicing. And one inscription called the East India House inscription, he wrote, In Babylon, my dear city which I love was the palace, the house of wonder of the people, the bond of the land, the brilliant place, the abode of the majesty of Babylon. A Babylonian writer by the name of, um, I can't remember, um, in 270 BC detailed for us all the great things that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had built. Alexander the Great visited Babylon, and other Greek historians also personally visited the city and recorded the things that Nebuchadnezzar had done. We begin, first of all, with his military achievements. He cleaned up the remnants of the Assyrian Empire. He crushed the Egyptians at the Battle of Carchemish. He acquired Syria. He ended the rebellion of Judea. He acquired Tyre. And Megasthenes is a Greek historian in 350 to 290 BC who said that Nebuchadnezzar owned most of Africa owned Europe to Spain and Portugal, resettled the inhabitants uh, of Spain and Portugal all the way over into the Caucasus Mountains, that's the Europe-Asia border. And so Nebuchadnezzar owned from, Atla from the Atlantic to the Caspian and Black Seas, all of Southern Europe, all the Middle East into Africa and Southern Asia. Those were his military, military exploits. And he took the conquered peoples from all of those places and resettled them to distant lands and he could use them as forced labor in his building projects. And his building programs he was far more famous for than for his military exploits. The city of Babylon itself he built as a rectangular city with a deep and wide water moat. The city was considered impenetrable. Double walls encircled the city. The inner wall at 11 feet thick and the next wall at 23 feet thick with defensive towers 60 feet, 60 feet apart from each other. He built another double outer wall, one wall at 23 feet thick and another at 25 feet thick. One section of that rectangular wall was 17 miles long and wide enough at the top to pass chariots past each other on. 
The outer wall alone required, as a low estimate, some 500 million square feet of solid masonry. The city had eight gates. The most famous is the Ishtar Gate at 110 feet wide and 47 feet high. It is on display in Berlin, even today at the Pergamon Museum. Some of you may have seen it. It was excavated in 1900, and it was covered with massive and beautiful bright blue and gold enameled bricks, depicting lions and bulls and dragons in artistic fashion. The Ishtar Gate led, led into a processional street that was 1,000 feet long, leading to the Temple of Marduk, and a seven-level pyramid that was nearly 300 feet tall. There were 53 temples in the city, three palaces within the city, Nebuchadnezzar's primary residence, his royal palace, probably the place he was walking on the roof of in verse 29, was 350 yards by 200 yards. That is a 630,000 square foot home. And attached to this palace were the famous hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Nebuchadnezzar built these hanging gardens for his queen, for his wife, Amidus. She was a princess of the mountainous regions of Medea. She was used to lots of vegetation and mountainous terrain. She didn't like living in the flat floodplain that was the Tigris-Euphrates uh, Valley. And so he built these hanging gardens with large mountainous rocks and a variety of plants and trees, irrigated by ingenious elevators that took water up and watered the entire series of gardens. Nearly every brick in Babylon found by archaeologists today is stamped with Nebuchadnezzar's name. He built breakwaters and large shipping docks on the Persian Gulf. He created massive canals to carry water. One of them was over 400 miles long. He built lakes and reservoirs, one at 140 miles in circumference and 180 feet deep with floodgates for irrigation. He built temples and public buildings for many other cities in the empire. The historian Herodotus personally visited Babylon a hundred years after Nebuchadnezzar and was astounded. Alexander the Great, 200 years after that, sought to make the city of Babylon his own capital. Nebuchadnezzar wrote in one of his own public records, the fortifications of Babylon I strengthened and I established the name of my reign forever. Nebuchadnezzar was a military genius. He was a competent leader. He was a great builder. He was, in fact, according to Daniel chapter 2, the head of gold in the progressive history of the empires of men. And yet, when we think about all of these things that he has accomplished, none of it was possible apart from the God of Israel, the God most high, the King of heaven. And when we think about great human achievements, we, we must remember Paul's words to the Corinthians, what do you have that you did not receive? Why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? Look down again at verse 30. The king reflected. He, he sat there on his roof and thought about it for a while and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself has built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? That is the king's boast. And while the king's boast is still in his mouth, verse 31, heaven responds. Here's heaven's response. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came down from heaven. Literally, a voice fell from heaven, saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it has been declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. This word fell like a load from heaven, a heavy load dropped from above. There's a vertical element here that Nebuchadnezzar needed to know. He is on the high spot of his palace. He is on top of the world politically. There is no one above him, not even his so-called gods. In fact, in the extant literature we can read from Nebuchadnezzar's own pen, there was a greatly diminishing religious reference as his career progressed. He didn't even pay attention to his own gods as he got more mature in his kingship. And yet a little word, three words in Aramaic, falls from heaven upon him. There's something significant, something weighty above you, Nebuchadnezzar. There is a, a message higher than you, bigger than you. There is a king above. It's a reminder of Luther's song about Satan. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers. 
here, a word falls from heaven. And what is that word to Nebuchadnezzar? Sovereignty is gone. And the verb tense is striking. Everything else has been this continual progression. And here, this is a done deal. Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty is over. It has departed from you. This means that Nebuchadnezzar is not sovereign. He's finished. This is on the spot and immediate. And what kind of sovereignty is it if it can be taken away so easily? Is Nebuchadnezzar the captain of his own soul? Uh, Can he really control his own destiny? God says no. Not only is he not sovereign over the empire, but you will not be sovereign, Nebuchadnezzar, over your own faculties. Look at verse 32. You will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle. Seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. In that moment, what, how, how quick and how easy is this change for God? And we need to feel the contrast to, to, to think about what it's like to be on top of the world and move to utter degradation. Nebuchadnezzar was convinced he was better than every man and he is reduced to a subhuman state. And we find out the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Here's the king's humiliation in verse 33. Immediately, the word concerned Nebuchadnezzar, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. And he was driven away from mankind, began eating grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. In that moment, at this word from heaven, there is immediate follow through. The time for mercy is over, the time to change is gone. Sovereignty and majesty and glory are replaced by abject humiliation. He's driven away from everything he loved. Nebuchadnezzar now is outcast, isolated, exposed, out of his mind, beastly. And verse 33 adds another detail. Hair like eagle's feathers, fingernails like bird claws. In chapter 7, we find that the fourth beast in the image in that chapter is has long claws. The same word is used here of his nails. He has become beastly even to have his nails grow out as claws. And there's dramatic uh, dramatic irony here uh, in the phrase, um, had grown. Um, That's not a throwaway phrase. In the Aramaic, it is grew great. His hair grew great and his nails grew great. And that is the same verb we find back in verse 20. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, um, whose height reached to the sky. And then down in verse 22, it is you, O king, you have grown great and you have grown strong. The same verbs in Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation are used to describe his hair and his nails. Nebuchadnezzar had grown great, Babylon had grown great, and now Nebuchadnezzar is humbled to a subhuman state, and what grows great are his unkempt hair and his unclipped nails. And this for seven years. No social interaction. He is alone, impaired, like an animal eating the greens of the field. Until he acknowledges that heaven rules. God is doing this for Nebuchadnezzar, no doubt. He is humbling Nebuchadnezzar for Nebuchadnezzar's own sake. It's critical to understand that God is doing this also for his captive people, Israel. They need to be comforted in their captivity as they look to Yahweh, their God, that he is in charge. They should have no doubts about who is ordering history. It might be tempting to think as an exile captive that, well, maybe the foreign gods are true. Maybe the Babylonian gods are stronger than our God. Maybe this regional deity pantheon theology, maybe there's something to it, and maybe we picked the wrong God. They needed to know that Yahweh, the God of Israel, was faithful and powerful to subdue every king on the earth, no matter what God he subscribed to. This is critical for the watching nations. All need to know that the God of Israel is the true and living God to whom all are accountable. And 
God is doing this to Nebuchadnezzar for us. But we need to recognize God's sovereignty, which includes care for his people. God will humble the proud in this life or in the next, and one day on the earth for all to see. The final kingdom on the earth will be none other than God's own kingdom, Messiah's kingdom, that rules on the earth. How did Nebuchadnezzar respond at the end of this time? Verse 34, we see the king's repentance. His repentance, beginning in verse 34. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Here, Nebuchadnezzar's sanity returns. And what is Nebuchadnezzar's first act saying? Worship. Worship. He is uttering worship of the one true God. And, and this is true sanity. To see yourself rightly before the living God. Turn to Romans chapter 1. There is a sense in which before a man is humbled before God, he is in a perpetual insanity. Romans 1.18 tells us, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is plain to them, for God has made it plain. What happens when someone says, I don't believe in God? That one is denying what that one knows to be true already at the heart level. God has planted in the human conscience, in the human heart, a knowledge of himself. To say, there is no God, is to suppress the truth within. And frankly, that creates an insanity. You have to be double-minded to know internally that God exists and to convince yourself, there is no God. In fact, when most people are pressed on this, they will revert to saying, well, no, I'm not atheist. Uh, you'd have to be omnipresent and omniscient to really claim atheism. I'm just agnostic. Well, what does that mean? Uh, that comes from the word agonosis, ignoramus, ignorance, I don't know, and an intentional unwillingness to know, and you're still guilty of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. God says you do know. That only produces an insanity. This is why the psalmist has said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Everybody knows God exists. And the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, is a display of that insanity. The fool also acts in his life as if there is no God. You don't have to be a professing atheist or agnostic to live as one to just carry on with life as if God doesn't exist, as if he doesn't hold us accountable, as if he doesn't care what we do on his green earth with the lives he has given us. And then another kind of fool makes gods out of created things. That's also in Romans 1. Even though they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks, they became futile in their speculations, their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. To worship some created thing in the place of God is the height of folly and an insanity from which we must all be rescued. Think about Nebuchadnezzar, I'm reminded of Psalm 49, 12. Man in his pomp will not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. Man without understanding is like the beasts that perish. And truly, any man in his arrogance, in all of his pride of his own humanity, not thinking rightly about who he is before the living God, will only face destruction. He is like a beast it is an insanity to live opposed to the true and living God, a, a suicidal insanity. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. True faith, surrendering to the one true God, is, is like waking up, thinking 
straight for the first time about yourself, about God, about the world around you. And can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar for a moment? In that moment that he looks up, lifts his gaze towards heaven. In whatever state he was in, whatever consciousness he was allowed in that moment to lift his eyes towards heaven, those first moments of sanity Can you imagine what it was like to to go from beastly to worshiping, to pick himself up off the ground, to clean his teeth? Probably looked like he lost a fight with a pesto sandwich, eating greens all the time. To notice his hair, to, to look at his nails and to ask, what have I become? What has what has happened to me? Praise God. That's Nebuchadnezzar's first response. I don't know if you've ever been in a trial where you are conscious that God was making you low. To lift your gaze to heaven, to have a newfound dependence on the Lord, to come through a trial and say, praise God for the trial. This is Nebuchadnezzar's response here. He experienced a stupefaction that was supernaturally given, and then that stupefaction was supernaturally removed. And notice how he says this transformation. He says, I raised my eyes towards heaven, and my reason was coming back to me. And two different verb forms in these two different sentences. He raised his eyes to heaven, kind of a one-time deal, and then his reason was coming back to him. Probably something of a a progress. And he says, and I blessed the Most High and I praised and glorified the one who lives forever. This feeble, humbled look to heaven. Reason is coming, rational faculties bringing into focus what had been obscure and confused, and then worship. Clear-headed, vertical, singularly directed worship. Look what Nebuchadnezzar says in the second half of verse 34. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can ward off his hand. No one can say to him, what have you done? I love that this is Nebuchadnezzar's response. He doesn't say, glad that's over, I need a haircut. He doesn't say, okay, 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 I'm going to add just a little bit of Yahweh to my life. I get it. He's one of the gods. He doesn't give royal orders to not speak trash against Yahweh. He doesn't issue some edict, don't speak against the God of Israel. Um, He's one of many, but don't make him mad. He doesn't reward the prophet in this scene. He, he's not doing his previous king stuff here. He is doing humbled, alone before God worship. And notice what he articulates in verse 34. The most high rules. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. This was the lesson he was supposed to learn. This was the lesson all the living are to learn from Nebuchadnezzar. And, and notice the present tense here. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. That is, God's rulership is now and later. It's now and forever. It is always, forever and ever, and it is present. It was current in Nebuchadnezzar's day. Despite what he had thought previously, it was always true. Yahweh, the God of Israel, is in charge of all things at all times. He is the king of kings forever, and he is king of kings right now. Now, we found out in chapter 2 that his kingdom is coming to the earth in a manifest way in the future. But even now in chapter 4, God rules over all the affairs of mankind. And notice in verse 35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. That is, the, the masses of people assembled around a giant golden statue. The crowds, the mob, the the peer pressure, world culture, world movements, nations, empires, even all the hordes of social media posters, trolls, and followers. 
they are all as nothing before God. And you and I feel the weight of masses of people. We feel the significance of crowds and, and we feel the pressure when everybody's going a certain direction. And Nebuchadnezzar here just says, they are all as nothing before God. He affirms God does according to his will in verse 35. Notice he does this in the host of heaven. The word for host here is simply the word for army. It was used of Nebuchadnezzar's own army in chapter 3. All the heavenly powers, all the heavenly armies are subject to God's inflexible will. And all the inhabitants of the earth. From top to bottom, beginning to end, every created thing, everything that exists, physical human beings and all creatures on the earth, and every spiritual power in the heavenlies, all of it yields to his inflexible will. And next, Nebuchadnezzar says, no one can ward off his hand. Literally, no one can smite God's hand. This is a word used to describe of the slap of the hand of a child to prevent some unwanted action, to rebuke, to interfere, to oppose. You know, when, when your kid takes one more prohibited cookie, don't do that. When your kid is trying to put the car keys into the electrical outlet again. <laughs> but no one slaps God's hand. No one rebukes him like a child. No one tells God no, at least for long. No one can say to him, what have you done? To question God's activities, to second guess his plan is presumption. Nebuchadnezzar says that's off limits. God is not accountable to his creatures. It, will the clay say to the potter, why did you make me this way? What have you done with me? And the answer to that rhetorical question in Romans 9 is no. God is sovereign. Nebuchadnezzar, in his newfound sanity, is more together than he's ever been. He affirms God's sovereignty, his eternality, his immensity, his independence, his transcendence, his omnipotence. He affirms God's singular right to act and not be questioned. It's interesting, the king of Nineveh the head of the Assyrian Empire, repented. You remember that from Jonah chapter 3? Jonah, the reluctant prophet, was afraid that if he preached repentance to the Assyrians, they might repent because God is gracious, and then he would really be upset because he didn't like the Assyrians. I mean, the Assyrians were bad. They did awful, horrible things. They would uh, cut women up. They would string their enemies up on their wall and display their flayed bodies for all to see. I mean, they were gruesome, awful people. And Jonah ran away from God's desire that they hear God's voice. God put him, in, put him there anyway. He preached, they repented. And an entire generation of Assyrians enjoyed a stay of judgment. King led his people in sackcloth and ashes and repented before the king of kings. I think it's interesting that the two nations, the, the two heads of state repented who were rulers of empires, the very nations that took God's people into captivity, Assyria and Babylon. Both the heads of those empires in one generation were humbled to repentance during their lifetimes for all the world to see. Now, not all the kings of Assyria did that. Not all the leaders of Babylon did that. They would be humbled in another way, at judgment. But would Israel and Judah repent of their idolatries and turn in faith to the one true God? It's a remarkable story that God will humble everyone one day, and God can humble anyone in this life. He brought Nebuchadnezzar to a clarity about who Nebuchadnezzar is before the one true God. And we see, fifthly, the king's restoration in verse 36. At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. 
So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Nebuchadnezzar gets to be king again. And he doesn't have to stage a coup. He doesn't gather an army and fight again for the throne room. He doesn't have to win an election or pay people off or poison some rival. The God of Israel restored him to the throne of Babylon. He goes on and says, my counselors and my lords sought me. Are these the ones that administrated the empire in his absence? Uh, Did they miss his leadership, his effective rule? Were they directed by Daniel? It is possible Daniel knowing and conveying to Nebuchadnezzar the very things that would happen to him. It is possible that Daniel helped them think through how do we preserve the empire in Nebuchadnezzar's absence. Maybe they were helped by the queen in holding the empire together. We're not told. What we do know is that God kept his word. God kept his word to humble Nebuchadnezzar and to restore him. And he is restored to what Nebuchadnezzar here calls surpassing greatness. That is his role, his majesty was greater than before. And we don't know how long he lived in this newfound greater majesty. But like Job after trial, Nebuchadnezzar after humiliation was raised up by God to greater honor than he had before. What a kindness of God. And then Nebuchadnezzar reflects finally, stage six, with a doxology. Look at verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true, and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Praise here is to ascribe honor. To exalt simply means to recognize the highness of someone, to honor is to bring glory to. These are worship terms all bundled together. He calls God here the king of heaven. That is, God is transcendent. He is the universal authority. Transcendent means he is big and he is beyond. He is way beyond the created order. He's way beyond every other authority. There's no place his authority doesn't reach. If he is the transcendent authority in heaven, ruling all the affairs of men, there is no authority that does not answer to him. The God of Israel is not some local deity to add to the collection. He is God, and there is no other. Nebuchadnezzar says all his works are true and his ways just. Literally, his doings are truth. And his ways are justice. If the king of heaven is doing it, it is right. He is the absolute moral authority. Think about what this means for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar here is saying, I was proud and God's dealings with me were appropriate. God's humiliation of me was truth and justice. And shouldn't we say this of all of God's dealings with us, particularly those trials that refine us, disciplines that demonstrate that he is indeed our father and he loves us, he has a vested interest in our Christ-likeness? Shouldn't we thank God's dealings with us that make us humble and more dependent upon him? And Nebuchadnezzar says, finally, he is able to humble those who walk in pride. This is true throughout the scriptures. God is opposed to the proud, gives grace to the humble. God will humble every proud heart. In Nebuchadnezzar's case, it it happened while he was still alive on the earth, and that's a mercy. A high view of God means a low view of self. When we have a high view of ourselves, it indicates we actually have a low view of God. When we're tempted to compare ourselves relatively to one another and esteem ourselves more highly than we ought, it, it's something like saying, oh, I'm taller than you are while we're standing at the foot of Mount Everest. <laughs> We've lost the infinite scale of the greatness of God and to think highly of ourselves is to diminish God and to think wrongly of ourselves and others. Now, was Nebuchadnezzar a Christian Christian? 
that's sort of an anachronistic question. The people of God were not called Christians until the first century at the city of Antioch, and there it was derogatory. You little Christs, and it stuck, and we like it. You can call us that. We might say, was Nebuchadnezzar a believer? Is Nebuchadnezzar an Old Testament saint? Did he experience Holy Spirit conversion? I've asked my library, and my library is divided on this one. Uh, There's a whole host of I don't knows, and then the remainder are really 50-50. And our heroes from church history and modern reliable commentators, uh, they're on either side of that question. I'm not sure I would venture a a 100% guarantee on this. I do think it's interesting that the Bible contains Daniel chapter 4 as the only chapter in all the Bible penned by a pagan king. And this chapter, penned by this pagan king, is the publication of his own humiliation. This is not what kings in the ancient Near East did. They wrote about their successes. They whitewashed their failures. There aren't records of pharaohs failing at war or the kings of Assyria or Medo-Persia or the Greeks or or the Egyptians or the Babylonians in their personal failures. Those things get scrubbed from the record. Here is Nebuchadnezzar's own failure and his own humiliation on display. And you remember how the chapter began? He says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the most high God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. And you remember that the first two verses are the punchline, they're the end that we just got to by verse 37. And then everything in between is that, okay, how did we get from where Nebuchadnezzar was to this amazing doxology that he's publishing to the world? His own utter humiliation. His getting to the end of himself. This confession here is certainly different than the confessions he gave prior, where he was obviously face to face with supernatural powers that he could not understand. Look back at chapter 2 and verse 47. After Daniel related the dream that no one else could and its interpretation, the king answered Daniel, verse 47, and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you've been able to reveal this mystery. And he gave Daniel a promotion. Daniel chapter 3, verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb. Their houses made a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Both of those confessions in the face of impossible miracles were not total abdication of his pantheon of idolatry. That was putting a little bit of Yahweh on the shelf with his other gods. What do I need to do to not make Daniel's God mad at me? What do I need to do to not, t- not make the God of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego upset with me? I'll give him a little tribute, I'll give him a place, and I'll make a rule. Nobody say anything bad about that God. That is far different than what Nebuchadnezzar is brought to in chapter 4. What's remarkable about chapter 4 as well is the story ends right there in verse 37. Chapter 5 begins with Belshazzar. And you remember in the scheme of this section towards the Gentiles in Daniel 2 through 7, we've got this telescoping reality where the inner reality is the climax or the apex. And right here in the center, chapter 4 and chapter 5, you have God's humiliation of two kings, one who repented in his lifetime and the other who's dead. And it's just remarkable, the contrast between chapter 4 and chapter 5. 
Belshazzar is killed in unrepentance, and the last words we have from Nebuchadnezzar, who died in 562 BC at the end of a 43-year reign, probably 80 years old, the rest of his life is not recorded in Daniel. The last words we're left with is Nebuchadnezzar and this doxology. And it's a good one, a sound one. It doesn't put Yahweh on the shelf with the other gods. It, it addresses him singularly as peerless. So whether God made Nebuchadnezzar an Old Testament saint by Holy Spirit conversion or whether by God's providence, he humbled a king to admit what everyone should admit all the time, which is absolutely true. Either way, what's on display here is God's absolute power over the affairs of men and his ability to bring any pride low. There's some takeaways for us to chew on a little bit from this chapter. I think about Matthew 10, 39, Jesus' question what profit is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? Nebuchadnezzar had everything, gloried in everything, stamped every brick in Babylon with his own name and wrote inscriptions that said, this is all for my glory. What would it be like to have all of it? To, to even have all of it for 43 years and to be 80 years old and then die and meet your maker, forfeit your soul. In one instant in eternity under the judgment of God, you would give up everything you ever gained on earth to have Christ, to have forgiveness of sin, to be out from under God's righteous wrath. And none of us will ever do better than Nebuchadnezzar in terms of conquests and possessions and successes. And yet it's all nothing in the end. A second takeaway for us is just to remember that the greatest earthly powers are subject to God. And it's so easy for him to turn the tide of human events. And I know we get concerned about politics and world empires and how's the world going to go. We, we do know the big picture, that Jesus will reign on the earth and he will get from every earthly power obedience one way or another. And the world will conform. His will will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. His kingdom will come. Our prayers will be answered. And whatever earthly powers happen between now and then, whatever kinds of governments we find ourselves under, we can trust that story. God is the author of history, and he's ushering all things without accident unto his one inexorable end. He will reign on the earth. That's a comfort for us. Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest power in his day, and it was easy for God to make him a cow. God can do as he pleases in heaven and on earth. A third takeaway, if you're a Jew in Babylonian exile, you should take comfort. Doesn't apply to anybody here. But that was the initial intended application of this chapter. What would it like to be in exile in Babylon as a Jew and wondering, is my theology wrong? Can I, can I trust God's word? Oh, look what God did with Nebuchadnezzar. And trust him, be comforted in him. Fourthly, there's a lesson to all the nations and all the living. It is the God of heaven that rules. Fifthly, uh, a comfort to us as we look in on this. God's in charge of history. God knows his people, loves his people, keeps his people. He keeps his promises. All these things bring us comfort. Sixth, I think, is a warning. If your approach to spiritual living is to add a little bit of Jesus to, the, to your otherwise idolatrous life, that's going to be a problem. What will come will be humiliations. Maybe in this life, 
as one idol of the heart after successive idol of the heart, whether it's money, relationships, materialism, just the idea that you can eke out of life some sort of satisfaction in and of itself, that you can pursue your own path and, and find happiness, each one of those idols will leave you. They will abandon you. They can't keep what they've promised. And even if you were to make it to 80 years old and your idols didn't disappoint you or you kept replacing them in order to keep up the charade, in the end, you will meet your maker. And any adding a little bit of Jesus to an otherwise fundamental idolatrous life will only bring you face to face with Jesus himself who demanded all of you. No rivals for affections. He is the one true God and worthy of all worship. To follow him is to take up our cross, to leave everything behind and follow him. And guess what? He's worth it. Seventh takeaway, there is a theology war here in this book and in this chapter. The humiliation of Nebuchadnezzar was a manifest assault by God on the regional deity theology. It's not dissimilar in our day to the view that all roads are okay. You know, we, in terms of spirituality and religion, a lot of people have sort of gone eastern. That is, the law of non-contradiction doesn't apply to spiritual things. You, you can believe east is west and north is south and two plus two equals seven and a half. And it doesn't matter. All roads lead to the same place. As long as you're sincere, we're all going to get there. Well, this chapter is an all-out war against such things. The God of Israel is opposed to the God Marduk, to the God Bel, to the God Nebo, to the 53 temples dedicated to various gods in the Babylonian pantheon right there in the city. And, and he will share no shelf space with those other gods. The thought that I'm okay, you're okay, you have yours and I have mine, it's all going to be okay. Um, smorgasbord theology, all of that goes out the window here. And that leads to a final contemplation for us. You, you have to be right with your maker before you go to meet him personally. You have to be right with him here while you have breath on the earth to look up to heaven and to have sanity, to think rightly about him, rightly about yourself, rightly about the world around you and why you're here. Listen, if you want to know how to be right with God, there is only one way. God himself came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. If you do not know him personally, would you talk to somebody, even tonight, about what it means to know God through Christ? You must while you still have breath. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to the earth to die in the place of sinners so that all who place their faith in you will have forgiveness of sin and a right relationship to your Father. You are our only hope. You are our singular love. And God, you know in our own hearts the ways we're tempted to various things that compete for affections. We love you. Help our love. We believe you. Help our feeble faith. God, we thank you so much for these reminders and we would be those who desire to be humble before you lest you be opposed to us. We ask it by your grace in Jesus' name.